Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is someone whose work I have long admired. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Women, Food, and God, and also many other books. I actually took a workshop with her a long time ago, and I consider her to be the mother of emotional eating. She was one of the first people that really started talking about using food as a drug back in the day. Please welcome her to the show, Janine Roth. It's a, quite an honor to meet you. I'm such a fan of your work and I appreciate what you do. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 people didn't talk about the emotional eating or food addiction or any of that for a very long time. And I think you really brought it to the forefront. Yes, because I was insane uh, in myself and about my relationship with food. It, it felt it, it felt like a mad, mad um, relationship. I don't even know what to say. I felt crazy inside, lacked willpower. I would go from losing weight to binging, losing weight to binging. And uh, the whole thing was uh, sort of wrapped in self-loathing. So, yes. You know, it's funny. I read your book 10 years ago and I re-listened re to it this weekend. And one of the things you said, even before listening to it again, I remember you said something to the effect of if they discovered a pill today that would make it so that we wouldn't gain weight, people would have to find another way to numb themselves. <laughs> well, I think what happens for many of us is that something's going on, some kind of feeling, I'm not good enough, I'm lonely. Uh, I need to do more, some judgment that we have about ourselves. And we express that through something external, like some of us express it through the relationship with food. Uh, but a lot of people express it um, by becoming workaholics or by turning to alcohol or drugs or something else to numb what's ever in here that we don't want to feel. Yeah. How do you define emotional eating? I would define it as eating when we're not hungry and not stopping when we've had enough. Right. So eating without regard to the body's need for food, eating because of internal cues, like a feeling of boredom, loneliness, not being good enough or external I'm um, feeling, although that's also is internal because where we feel it is inside. I'm feeling stressed about going to a holiday dinner or going out uh, with friends or about this deadline I'm under. And so turning to food for that reasons other than the body's cues for okay. food. Do you feel though that people use particular kinds of foods to numb? I mean, I don't, I don't see anybody going to arugula anonymous these days. <laughs> well, I think, I think even if you're on something like the keto diet or the paleo diet, or you do intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, you can definitely binge on some of those things as well. For instance, if you're on keto, you can binge on cheese. I do have a friend who eats voluminous amounts of cheese. Um, if you're on paleo, well, I don't really know what you would binge on on their vegetables, or I can't quite imagine that. Although some people do. Um, I think if you, what you want to do is numb yourself, then almost any kind of food will do. Although it's true, I don't know anybody who's binged on arugula. I haven't heard that. <laughs> Well, you say that how we do one thing is how we do everything and that our relationship with food is just a microcosm of everything else in our life. Yes, I do say that because you're the one that's doing it. So if I believe that I can't get enough, that's a belief that I have that is based on some associations and memories uh, of not being enough, possibly. I remember I felt like that very strongly when I was growing up. I just wasn't enough. I never got good enough grades. I never worked hard enough. I wasn't thin enough. I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't successful enough. And so I also felt like I never got enough food. So, so the beliefs that we have are reflected in everything we do. 
So, which another thing I say that's similar to that is that the world is on our plates. So if you want to look and see what you believe, take a look at your plate, take a look at what's on your plate, but also ask yourself, and I do this a lot in the eating meditations at our retreats, ask yourself, how old is she or he who took that food? So if I'm eating straight mashed potatoes and a mountain of mashed potatoes on my plate, how old is that one? I'm probably like eight years old. And at the point where I was told that I wasn't allowed to have mashed potatoes and the amount of mashed potatoes that I took on my plate has nothing to do with what's going on inside my body. And so that's eating because I want to say, you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to eat as many mashed potatoes as I want. And so I'm having an argument with someone who's no longer there. And that will track you back to what you're believing. Yeah. Why do you think that women particularly want to be thin so badly? I mean, there are men too, but I think women, it's more of a woman thing that you, the desperate seeking thinness. I, um, women are more identified and objectified, really. It's the objectification uh, uh, by the size of their bodies than men. And so I am what I weigh is something that I often hear with women, whereas that doesn't happen, although I think it's happening more and more with and for men, it, it traditionally hasn't happened um, with men so much. A man can gain or could have gained five pounds and it was, oh, I gained five pounds or I have a big belly or I've gained 10 pounds and I have a big belly, but doesn't seem to penetrate to the core of their self-worth. Yeah. You've said, if you want to change the shape of your body, you have to change your beliefs. Well, because you are acting out of your beliefs. So if I'm acting out of, I can't get enough or I'm valueless, or I will always be a failure no matter what I do, then what the hell I might as well eat. So I think it's very important to track back to your beliefs. Yes. You mentioned that when you didn't start binging until you started dieting. Until I started restricting myself of food and started telling myself I was bad if I ate ice cream. I was bad if I ate potato chips. I was bad if I ate fried chicken. I was started dieting when I was 11. And that is when 80% of girls start dieting as well um, with this intense scrutiny on body size and also uh, possibly going through puberty and having body changes happen then. But uh, what I also say is that for every diet, there's an equal and opposite binge. That's the fourth law of the universe because when you restrict and restrict and restrict and restrict and shame and shame and shame, some part of you is going to break out and say, no, no longer, no more. Right. Well, you said the best predictor of weight gain is having gone on a diet. Yes. Right. Most people will gain back all the weight they lost and more. Yeah. And then believe that if only they could lose the weight, they would be happy. Yeah. And one of the things I, I wrote down that I love what you said is food becomes the secondary problem when the original problem becomes uncontrollable. Well, I would probably change the wording on that right now. If I could write that again, I would say, yes, food and what you eat is still the secondary problem. I would replace the word uncontrollable with um, when the original problem has not been addressed, paid attention to, turned to with tenderness or kindness. I think a lot of what we do with food is a way that on the surface looks like we're trying to take care of ourselves. And so we're, it looks like we're trying to be kind and give ourselves something, at least, if we feel deprived or, or if we've been abused. The problem with it or the challenge with it is that it ends up feeling like we're heaping 
suffering on top of suffering or abuse on top of abuse. Because if we're eating when we're not hungry, then we're not really listening to what we really are hungry for. And so we are ignoring ourselves the way we've been ignored. If for instance, uh, 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 like one of my students did, her mother was not home a lot. She felt abandoned by her mother, abandoned by her father. And she felt like food was, and I wrote about this a lot in When Food is Love, food was her hugs and her kisses, food was, um, her comfort, food was her best friend, food didn't talk back, food didn't hit, food didn't go away, food didn't abandon, food was always, always there. And so we turn to food as comfort, but it's a double-edged sword because then we start shaming and judging ourselves for having eaten, which is exactly what she did. Yeah. If you were writing the book today, is there anything else you might change or add? I don't know. I would have to really read that book again. It's a good book. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes. I'm glad. <laughs> is, is emotional eating the same as compulsive eating or are they different? No, I would say they, they're uh, pretty much the same. And what about food addiction? Do you, I mean, some people don't even resonate with their term or believe that certain foods for certain people might have an addictive like component. Well, I think it's possible. I think from what I've read, and I read the first book about that decades ago called Sugar Blues, and uh, many, many people have written about sugar being as addictive as cocaine, and, and that when they start eating, one, it's hard to stop eating because of the biochemical reaction that it has in our bodies. So I think it's quite possible uh, that there are certain foods that, that feel addictive. Um, I also think what's as addictive, if not more addictive, is getting away from ourselves, is being addicted to not turning to ourselves, not even knowing how to turn towards ourselves rather than away from ourselves. So the turn towards food is towards something out there. Out there is going to make me feel better. Whereas what I'm talking about is really turning towards yourself. So turning and befriending yourself, being kind to yourself, asking yourself what it is you really need. Because when you're not hungry, it's not food. Food is a good stand-in, but it's not food. Right. One of the things I love that you said is people want to learn to have different bodies, not to occupy the ones that they have now. <laughs> right. I always wanted to have uh, my, when I was in high school, I had a bunch of friends who seemed to be naturally thin, thin because they could eat anything they wanted. And I wanted bodies like them. And I think it's, it's, challenging to realize that we've got the bodies we've got with all their foibles and all their beauties. And uh, to even have a body is a lucky, lucky thing. It's, you know, to have arms, to have legs, to be able to taste food, to chew food, to see out of these eyes. You know, I'll often start a meditation with my retreat students, with settling into the bodies we've got and into realizing, really feeling the feet on the floor, your butt in the chair, wiggle a hand, wiggle another hand, realize that it's really important to come out of the mind and into the body because the bodies are where we get these signals. And also to feel some gratitude, huge thanks for this body that has schlepped us around and upon which we have piled some abuse and many of us, a lot of abuse. When I think of the abuse that I piled onto my body, I was thinking about this yesterday. There were a couple of months in high school where all I did was eat grape nuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, grape nuts. Another time I just ate one hot fudge Sunday a day. Uh, so 
the the lack of protein and fat and good nutrients that I gave my body. I mean, I feel very fortunate to have lived this long. Wow. Yeah, you, you mentioned meditation. I remember the part in your book where you went to a silent meditation retreat and you wanted to bolt. Yes, right. Yeah. I think bolting or leaving when it gets hard is something that a lot of us know how to do, particularly in this digital age, that we're so used to this ongoing and constant stimulation and the hit, the expectation, the adrenaline that comes and that hit of something exciting is going to happen, happen and happen and happen. The clickbait uh, is ongoing. And that is a way we leave ourselves. We leave ourselves again and again. We self-abandon over and over and over and through our digital devices, through, you know, just clicking on one thing, then another thing, and then another thing, and then forgetting what we really went to the computer or the phone for. I often do that. I'm not happy to uh, report. Uh, And it is a way I leave this, this very moment and what's ever happening in this very moment. Yeah. You know, this is an interesting comment from Lisa, who's watching live. Most of us are not taught to love our body. We see our mother hating herself and we also do the same thing. Yes, we do, Lisa. Yes, we do. You know, speaking of bolting, Rebecca, who's watching live says, but how do we deal with that urge to bolt? by paying attention to it. You know, we've really gotten used to, and I'm not gonna be very popular when I say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We've gotten used to, here are the top three tricks that you can use not to bolt. And one, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that I teach is paying attention to what you're doing. So watching yourself, Leave yourself over and over and over again and feeling, and I would say in many ways, this this is not a trick, but it's a way that you can think of yourself. How do you, how do you treat yourself? If you saw a child who was having a difficult time sitting on the side of the road, would you uh, leave her there? Would you give her a phone or an iPad and say, here, sister, play a video game. If she was sad or lonely or bored, would you give her an ice cream cone or would you really sit beside her and say, talk to me, sweetheart, tell me what's going on? Yeah. Do you think that most people are miserable because of their weight or because of the feelings that caused them to eat that created the weight? I think that um, it's the latter. If your weight is causing you physical disability, if it's hard for you to walk, if it's um, putting pressure on your joints, if it's raising your blood pressure, if there's something actual, you know, actually going on physically, I th- that's making it hard for you to be comfortable in your body, then that's on the physical level. On the non-physical level, there are all of the, or one or two of the reasons you started eating to begin with. Your beliefs about yourself, who you really are, your worth. Um, Food is a wonderful distraction and the whole compulsion with food is an endless distraction. So I think it's the latter, AJ. Because you said food becomes the secondary problem when the original problem becomes uncontrollable. Right. We talked about that a couple of minutes ago, where I said I would change the wording on uncontrollable, but yes. Yeah. You said something that I thought was really interesting in the book that not all binging is driven by restriction because I always thought that there was no binging or bulimia in people that hadn't had a history of of restricting or dieting first. And what else did I say? B12. 
because I can't remember what the rest of that paragraph was. Well, I don't remember the whole paragraph, paragraph, but that's when you started talking about the difference between restrictors and permitters. Right. Yeah. So um, for a restrictor, a diet uh, is a wonderful thing for at least a while because it provides structure. Restrictors like structure. They like order. And they are very disciplined until, of course, they can't take it anymore. And then they binge. So that's where the every diet leads to a binge part comes in. For a restrictor, it's the motto is less is less is more. Restrictors, for the most part, when they're in the dieting phase, like going without. That's a line from Middlemarch, George Eliot's book about Dorothea and uh, one of the main characters, protagonists in that novel where, where her sister says she likes going without. That's a restrictor. A permitter, more is more and more is often not enough. So whereas a, per, a restrictor has a very hard time saying yes to herself, a permitter has a hard time saying no. And so permitters binge because it's a way of forgetting themselves. They don't, for the most part, like order, like discipline, not really ever been successful on a diet, have a very short, short um, tolerance. If they have been on a diet and it's not working right away, then a binge usually follows. Yeah. So you were, I'm guessing you were a restrictor. I was a restrictor. Yes. You have to have been a restrictor to be anorexic, which I was for a while. Yes. I fasted for a month at every change of the season. Uh, One week of that was a water fast. The damage I did to my body uh, is is kind of astonishing, really, all in the name of being thin, all in the name of being thin. But really, I should say, all in the name of relieving the internal pressure of not liking myself, because I really did believe that if and when I got thin, then my problems would be solved, because it seemed like every problem was the result of not being thin. And you found out quickly that wasn't true. Right. Yeah. Mandy, who's watching live, wants to know what is the best book for her to start with of yours? Because you have so many. Um, I would say you might as well start with Women, Food, and God because um, it uh, talks about so much in there. And so I would recommend starting with that. And you, and if, if people like the audio version, you read it and you do a terrific job. So I would, I think that's, that would be a great way to go. You know, I, I didn't take your, your retreat, but you were one of the presenters at a Hay House conference in Pasadena, the Helium. Oh, conference. I remember that. Yes. And so you, they had breakout sessions and I took one of your breakout sessions where we did an exercise with a Hershey kiss and a potato chip. Right. That's about really paying attention to what you eat and eating slowly and really tasting food and how the taste of food changes. One of the things we do at our retreats is we do an eating meditation for breakfast every morning. And so people come hungry, they choose the food they want to be eating, and then we sit and we eat together and really taste the food without distractions. And for many people, it's the first time they've done this ever. And for those people who come back to retreats and have been coming back to many retreats over the years, it's the time where they get to be with themselves and they realize, oh, wow, I never tasted an avocado before. Or, gee, I don't ever really feel satisfied unless I I crunch on food. I like the crunch. And so you discover things about food that you never, ever, ever would discover unless you slow down and eat with distractions. When I used to do the, that Hershey's Kiss exercise in a workshop, uh, 
people would say things like, I've eaten thousands of these, but I've never eaten just one. Or I never realized I didn't like these. <laughs> so until you eat paying attention, you actually don't realize what so, you like and don't like. In a way, you, you were teaching mindfulness. Yes. Yeah. Which can be useful in, in all areas of our life, but especially people that s- struggle with eating and overeating. Right. Yeah. Well, how often do you do these retreats? How long are they? And where do you do them at? Right now, they're only on Zoom. So uh, people from all over the world come, which is quite exciting. And I think we'll probably continue on Zoom for a while. I do them twice a year. They're six days long. Uh, We just finished one in November. So the next one is in May. It's not too soon to sign up because uh, the retreats fill up um, pretty quickly, although we've just posted it. So you still have time and they're, they, they are, oh, they're fabulous events. They're fabulous, not only because of doing the eating meditation every day, which is a highlight of the retreat, uh, but also because of being in a field with other women who feel exactly the same way. And uh, so you don't feel alone and other women who are really looking deeply to see what's at the core of my issues with food. And so the day starts with movement and meditation that anybody can do. You can do it in a chair if moving is uncomfortable. And then we go to the eating meditation, take a break, and then we come back together as a group. And I usually talk And then we do a lot of little breakout groups in three and four, where I ask, where I've asked questions and people answer them in monologues or what we call repeating questions. And then we come back together as a group and um, uh, I work with quite a few people uh, about what came up for them. That's the afternoon session. And the evening session is a relax and unwind session often with music. It's lovely. It's beautiful. I, well, I'll post the link to that in the chat in the show notes. It says it's May 15th through the 22nd. So right. if people are doing it at home, then they're providing their own food. Yes. Right. Right. Which is actually, we found out after doing it for a long time in person with the pandemic, obviously we stopped doing it in person And we weren't sure how it was going to work, but it works as good, if not better, than doing it in person because people are at home, in their homes. I mean, they do carve out a sacred space for themselves where they won't be disturbed for a little while, even the people with small kids and dogs running around. Um, They carve that out, but because they're already home, they don't have to go through flying, jet lag, um, getting used to the environment, having a roommate that snores, not liking the food. They get to make their own food. And, And this happens day after day. So it gets integrated into their lives quicker than flying away for it. We also, starting in August, we'll have um, what I call in-between retreat intensives that anybody who's been to a retreat can come. That will be in person in Northern California in August. They have been also on Zoom for the last few years. And our February one in-between is also uh, on Zoom. And also people get as much support as they want after the retreat. We have calls, we have small groups, we have, you just name it. Because what I realized from watching and being quite close with people in the anonymous programs, that support is crucial. And so we added many, many layers of support for people. Yeah, and we break up, people break up into buddies, so to speak, so that they speak to their buddies or their partners anywhere from once to three times a week. 
You know, just about every expert in this space I've interviewed said support is, is crucial. Yeah. It's negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you said in the epilogue of Women, Food, and God was we don't want the hot fudge Sunday. We want to be the hot fudge Sunday. I like that. Right. We want our lives to be hot fudge Sundays. And I think most of us would only, if we had a choice, A, a hot fudge Sunday, B, our lives as delicious as a hot fudge Sunday in terms of internally satisfying and joyful, we would choose a delicious life. And I think because most people or many people don't know that's actually a choice, they'll choose a hot fudge Sunday. Yeah. yeah. You've been meditating for a long time now, haven't you? I have over 40 years. That's amazing. Like, do you do it twice a day for 20 minutes or? I do do it twice a day. Um, in the morning, I do it anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes. And in the evening, probably 10 to 20 minutes. What I really like to do and what I tell my students is short glimpses many times a day so that you don't save it all. This kind of awareness, paying attention. You don't, another way of saying it is gathering your particles of attention back in. So you're not saving that just for a half an hour in the morning, or I would actually recommend to students who have never meditated, start with three minutes. We always start slowly. Um, but so that all that attention is not just concentrated in the beginning of the day and the end of the day, but that you have moments many times a day, just right. even for three breaths. You know, they, they really have shown the neuroscientists, when I say they, that's what I mean, that um, three breaths of looking at something beautiful or that you find beautiful or satisfying is enough to come back to yourself and start inscribing into your brain so that your brain starts uh, uh building neural pathways, they're called, or tracks into beauty. So if you do that a couple times a day, three breaths, looking at something beautiful, that's a moment. And that allows you to come back, come back, come back to yourself, to realize that even though you're living in your mind, nothing is actually wrong. And, and that's another thing that I'll ask people a lot. Tell me what's not wrong right now. Yeah, I love that. That reminds me of an old Jewish joke. I love that. <laughs> what's that? Oh, yeah. so the, um, the, the, uh, there four Jewish women are having lunch and the waiter comes up to them and says, is anything all right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. You've had many different shapes and sizes of your body from anorexic to obese and everything in between. When did you know, was there a moment where you knew this, that you've had this figured out for yourself and that you weren't going to struggle or suffer anymore? I don't think, you know, anybody's done until they're dead. So um, I would say, no, what, when I, re what I realized was that I was going to stop dieting and restricting. And that happened in uh, quite a while ago. Uh, and I felt released. I felt like I, I, somebody, I was actually breaking a 10th or an 11th commandment that said, thou shalt feel guilty and ashamed about the size of your body for the rest of your life. And when I started um, eating what my body actually wanted, and stopping when my body had enough, I felt released. And I was then the heaviest I had ever been. And the release from the shame and the self-loathing around food was so joyous that I didn't really care whether I lost weight again or not. It was the joy I wanted, the deliciousness of 
the Hot Fart Sunday Life, which happened when I released the judgment and shame, which happened when I stopped dieting and made a promise to myself that I was not going to go on another diet again. Right. And that's exactly when you started losing weight. Well, I did um, may, I did not lose weight right away. I, cause I ate, those were the days where all I wanted was sugar because that was what I thought I wasn't allowed to have. And so if I was going to let myself eat what I wanted or thought I wanted, it was only sugar. So it was a couple of weeks of chocolate chip cookie dough and pumpkin ice cream uh, it was in the fall. And so there was a lot of pumpkin this and pumpkin that around like there is now. Uh, and so I didn't lose weight right away. I, I re it really took a couple of weeks of me realizing I really was not going to shame myself anymore. And I could now listen deeply. Uh, you know, eating what you've forbidden yourself is not the same as eating what your body really wants. Those are really two different things. Yeah, absolutely. Because in your eating guidelines, well, let's talk about your eating guidelines. When did you develop these? When I first started the, you know, leading groups in 1979 or 80, however many years that was ago, which is a long time ago. People are saying they can't even imagine you being any larger and they're asking if you have any photos. I, you know, I have one photo, a good friend of mine took, I was thinking about this the other day and I don't know where it is, but I know I could probably find it somewhere. Do you ever worry that you could go back to that weight? Well, if my brain, if my neurochemistry got very messed up, I'm sure I could. I don't worry that I would go back to that weight because I'm unhappy or bored or lonely. Although I sometimes am, depending on whatever beliefs I'm listening to at the moment, which I try not to you know, become aware very quickly that I'm listening to some old beliefs that aren't true. I don't, I don't, you know, like at Thanksgiving, for instance, I ate, more than I usually eat. I have a hunger scale of one to 10. One is really hungry, five is comfortable, 10 is stuffed. I usually eat till around a five so that when I get up, I feel light uh, enough. And I ate to about a seven or an eight. So much so that the man, a man at the table said to me, I just can't believe how much you can eat. Um, and <laughs> And he said that to me twice. And it was true. I was eating quite a lot, um, more than my husband was eating. Um, but I stopped at around a seven. I felt okay, maybe seven and a half. But then I did not feel so good afterwards. I just didn't feel good the next because I ate things I don't normally eat. Somebody made a gluten free lasagna. And my husband had been raving about this particular lasagna for three years. And I thought, okay, well, in, different, in addition to the turkey and the cranberry sauce and the stuffing, which my husband and I made, um, I'm going to really taste this lasagna. And it was good, but it wasn't that great. And it's not anything that I would normally eat. And it took me two days to get over that. Not because I ate I mean, I think it was because I ate things that were much richer than I usually eat. And so I, in my antipathy to spending more time in the state that I was in for Friday and Saturday, I'm not, I'm not doing that again, to the point where we went to a friend's house uh, yesterday for Thanksgiving leftovers. And I just would not, would not veer from what and there were some fabulous foods there and it was no I'm not going back there no so I have to have amnesia if I'm going to be eating like you know just <laughs> eating like that because I'm so uncomfortable when I do and I don't like being uncomfortable right well that's where paying attention helps yes it does
It well, does. You have seven eating guidelines, but two of them really stand out for me because if everyone did even those two, I don't think we'd have an obesity epidemic, which is eat when hungry and eat until you're satisfied. Right. And so it takes a while for people. The thing about each of these guidelines is that they're a whole world unto themselves. So eat when you're hungry is that hunger scale, that physical hunger scale, one to 10, but there's also an emotional hunger scale. So if you're feeling needy or empty or lonely or bored or sad or angry or enraged, um, then you rate yourself on that scale and you notice where those two numbers correlate with each other. And then you, then you pay attention and you figure out where you experience hunger. Some people experience it in their backs, believe it or not. Other people in their throat, in their chest, in their bellies. And so, yes, there's that. And hunger also is associated with needs and wants. And so that's a process. Um, but on the simplest, on the very simplest level, it's the hunger scale. Where are you? And then you stop when your body tells you it's had enough. But, and... In order for your body to tell you it's had enough, you have to be paying attention. So if you're on Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, watching a video or anything like that, you're not going to be able to tell when you've had enough until you've way passed enough. Four, five, and six on that hunger scale are the enough points. And so uh, you could eat till you're 10 and not even realize it till you stop eating. Right, that's why one of your guidelines is eat without distraction. Yes, right. The one, the one that worries me for some people is eat what your body wants because I, I have, like you said at first, all you ate was sugar because you felt that was what you couldn't have. Right, and I think that is probably a guideline that I would write more about if I was going to make an addendum or write another book. I would say that, because most of us um, are geared to or oriented to certain foods because of associations and memories or because we see other people eating them or because of the way they sound, we don't often know well enough what our bodies want. How can your work help us get through this difficult holiday season? I mean, some people had a win Thanksgiving and, and ate according to some of your guidelines. Other people didn't do as well, but we've got a few more holidays coming up. Hanukkah, Christmas. Right. Tonight's the second night of Hanukkah. Yep. Um, I think following those eating guidelines is really helpful or, or just deciding you're going to follow one or two. Just again, little baby steps, not, you know, so to speak, biting off more than you can chew. Right. Well, other than your retreat next May, are there ways that people can connect with you? Do you do social media? Do you have a podcast? How can people find out? I do. You can connect with me on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash Janine Roth, Instagram. Uh, and that's pretty much what we're working on a podcast, but it's not yet in production. So I would say come to a retreat. That's the best way to take a deep dive. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram and then, and read the book. I think reading women, food and God or breaking free from emotional eating. That's a kind of primer that book. I would say reading one or both of those books would be a fabulous way to start. On our website, there are also, which is JanineRoth.com, there are, there are many articles you can read for free. There are, um, I also write this uh, blog called The Cancer Chronicles because I've just been through breast cancer and uh, I've written about that and its relationship to food. So you'll find that on my Facebook page. I've been writing that. There are over a hundred entries on that. So you can also read about food. I'm just about to write one today about food and about this picture I sent my mother and uh, 
she she uh, wanted to see this pair of shoes that I had, and I sent it. I I tried them on with this very large sweater that I had, and she called me and she said, "You're fat," and I had got a good laugh out of that. Uh, and I did say to her, "Mom, do you just realize you just told me I'm a fat?" And uh, she said, well, "I didn't really mean that. I meant." you know, in that outfit with those shoes and that very bulky sweater, you're fat. So I am just about to write a cancer chronicle about that. Um, so I'm always writing about food on Facebook and Instagram. So you can follow me there. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for the work you've helped so many people who've had quite an extraordinary life and you always seem to land on your feet. <laughs> thank you so much. And the best and blessings to everybody. I would say the way to get through this holidays with sanity is to be kind to yourself and to, and to actually take a moment and write down what being kind and being tender to yourself actually means. I can promise you it will not mean stuffing yourself until you're so uncomfortable, you can't think. What's being kind? Is it going outside? Is it just moving your arms and legs? Is it uh, writing five things you're grateful for? Is it just figure it out and do it for five minutes a day? That is a good grounding and a good touch point. So thank you, thank you everybody, many blessings. Thanks so much. Thank you, Janine, and happy holidays. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another.